Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the University of Alberta, I'd like to thank you for joining us here tonight. I am Dr. Carrie Smith, Vice Provost Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the U of A, and I'm so glad to be here for the visiting lectureship in human rights. We're joined here tonight by Dr. Stan Blade, Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Science, and of course, our keynote speaker, Michael Fakiri, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Before we continue with tonight's events, it's important that we respectfully acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Tonight's event is the official kickoff of U of A Days, a celebration of our university's connection to the Edmonton and Camrose communities. U of A Days is a weekend of fun, games, music, and discovery. During U of A Days, we welcome back hundreds of alumni to the university. I'd like to extend a special welcome to alumni who are here tonight, and I wish you a happy U of A Days. It's also a time when we welcome the world to our campuses, and where we showcase all the amazing things that are going on. In addition to tonight's lectureship, there are a number of events running throughout the weekend here on North Campus, as well as on our Augustana campus and at Campus Saint-Jean. We're a world leader in post-secondary education and research, and although our network stretches around the globe, U of A Days gives us a chance to really strengthen our connections to our communities here in Alberta, so welcome. Looking around, and as everyone was coming in tonight, I saw a lot of green and gold in the audience, which is always great to see. Tonight's keynote speaker, Michael Fakiri, is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, a role he has held since 2020. In this role, Michael works closely with all levels of government, as well as non-governmental organizations to ensure that all humans regardless of location, gender, age, or religion, have access to food. Through his work, Michael promotes the belief that food is a human right. According to the 2022 edition of the UN State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, as many as 828 million people were affected by hunger in 2021. This represents 9.8% of the global population, meaning almost one in 10 people are affected by hunger. And another 2.3 billion people were food insecure, meaning their access to food was precarious. These are staggering statistics, and I know Michael is working to lower these numbers. With his leadership, I'm confident that these numbers will drop, but it will take a global effort. When it comes to hunger and food insecurity, it's important that we look at it from international and local levels. Here at the U of A, we are doing our part to help make the world a better place for everyone. We work diligently every day to find solutions for some of the biggest challenges of our time. And this includes ending global hunger and ensuring that all people have access to a safe and healthy food source. And although there is still work to do, there always is. We are making progress toward the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. This is an important part of who we are as an institution. In fact, the U of A was recently ranked seventh in the world and second in Canada for its ongoing efforts to tackle the critical sustainability challenges facing civilization today. According to the latest Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, these rankings, which were the best ever showing by the U of A, cited our ability to harness innovative ideas to create inclusive and sustainable industrialization and our work to sustainably manage forests and biodiversity loss as some of our greatest strengths. 
I'm proud to say that the U of A ranks second in the world when it comes to addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number two, zero hunger. This goal aims to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. The substantial research underway at the university at specialized centers like Agri-Food Discovery Place and the Food Safety and Sustainability Engineering Research Program contributed to our high ranking in this category. Initiatives like the Campus Food Bank that seeks to end hunger on a local level, as well as our commitment to sourcing and serving more healthy, affordable, responsible, and sustainable food on campus also contributed to our ranking. Overall, these results showcase our ability to collaborate as one university, bringing together diverse perspectives and knowledge for the public good. I could talk about our commitment to sustainability all night, and it's something I'm passionate about, as you can tell, as I know many of you are too who are here in the audience tonight. And that's why I'm so excited to have Michael here with us to outline what is being done, as well as areas where we can help. Before I welcome Michael to the stage, let me tell you a little bit about the history of this lectureship. The University of Alberta launched this lectureship in 1998 in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The 30 banners processed to the stage represent the 30 articles of the declaration. They remind us of the commitments undertaken as signatories to the declaration back in 1948 and they serve as signposts marking where we are and showing us where we still need to go. The university's goal in offering this lectureship is to provide our students and the people of Alberta with an opportunity to understand the complex issues at play in the world and to also provide pathways and encouragement for us all to address current human rights issues. The lectureship continues the long tradition at the university of providing a safe environment to discuss controversial and difficult subjects, and by doing so, provides an opportunity for each of us to learn, question, and participate in events shaping the world in which we live. We are thrilled that this year marks the 75th anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration, and that for the past 25 years, this annual lecture has been a key event in our university calendar. This achievement would not be possible without the incredible support of our donors, who under leadership gifts from the Stollery Charitable Foundation, Judy and John Cosco, and the Honorable Dr. Lois Hole and family have made this possible. A very sincere and warm welcome to all our donors who are with us tonight and our gratitude for your support that has made this work possible. I am also very excited to share that the endowment created to support this annual lecture now provides financial support for U of A students interested in undertaking an internship in the field of human rights. The first recipient of this award is Anne Joshua, a fourth year political science and international studies student. This past summer, Anne undertook a three month placement in Berlin with Global Innovation Gathering, an organization working with communities in the Global South on locally driven capacity building initiatives. Among the issues being addressed are the need for individuals and communities to participate in the digital space and the issues of access and protection of privacy that arise in this participation. I am so pleased that Anne had such a positive and transformative experience in Berlin. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 2023 Visiting Lecturer in Human Rights, Michael Fakiri. Fakri. Dr. Fakri assumed his role as UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food in 2020. He has used his annual reports to bring attention to human rights violations caused by structural inequalities and different forms of violence in our food systems. The impact of COVID-19 on food security and nutrition, the need to address biodiversity and human rights in seed systems, and to reconsider how international trade law impacts the right to food. He has a distinguished career advancing dialogue on human rights issues around the world. His work includes both grassroots engagement and advocacy to international organizations such as the WTO and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Dr. Fakri earned his doctorate from the University of Toronto, 
a Master of Laws from Harvard Law School, a Bachelor of Law from Queen's University, and a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Western University. Prior to his academic career, he worked in private practice and was a founding executive member of the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association. He is a professor of law at the University of Oregon and currently directs the university's Food Resiliency Project, which advances policy and environmental issues at all stages of the food system, from production to consumption. He is recognized as an outstanding educator, having received numerous awards throughout his career including those selected and bestowed by students. Please join me in welcoming Michael Fakri to deliver tonight's visiting lectureship in human rights. Hello. Hi. OK. So thank you everyone for coming tonight, especially on a, such a beautiful day and a beautiful fall day. And campus is so, it's, I mean, you really do have a lovely campus, I have to say. And I've been told this is every day in Edmonton is like this. <laughs> um, I find gatherings like this to be very meaningful um, ever since the COVID-19 pandemic, and I don't take them for granted. I'm very honored to deliver this year's lecture and commend the University of Alberta's 25-year commitment to this annual lecture on human rights. This type of commitment should not be taken for granted. I'm grateful to everyone at the University of Alberta who made this lecture possible and for my visit uh, to, to happen. I also want to thank my spouse, Lisa Romano, and my young son for making it possible for me to travel and deliver this lecture. If any of you have had young children under your care, you know how hard travel can be on a family. Most of my lecture today is based on my experience as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Special Rapporteurs are elected by the UN uh, Human Rights Council. Our job is to be the eyes, ears, and good conscience for the UN system. My particular mandate is to focus on all matters regarding hunger, malnutrition, and famine from a human rights perspective. We are independent experts, but it, we do come with some degree of authority. Um, but the way I understand my role uh, as a UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food is that it's my job to talk, listen, and learn from as many people and from as many communities as possible and then share what I learn in public. So there is, of course, a time and place to play the role of the expert with official authority, also to be a passionate advocate. But at the heart of the position, the way I see it um, from, from the way I do my job is to be a student who is often eager to share with everyone what they have learned. And I was privileged today to meet and listen and learn from a number of community groups based here in Edmonton who are working on food security and food sovereignty. And I see some of you here are back for more tonight. I've also learned a lot from my conversations with the good people behind the Rupert's Land Center. Um, I really encourage you to check out their podcast on Métis Food Sovereignty as well as the Aramat Project, which looks to uh, working to strengthen indigenous voices and capacities um, uh, and document their knowledge about the importance of the whole environment to the health and well-being of indigenous communities. Indeed, many of us here tonight are an uninvited guests on indigenous territory. I'm originally from Lebanon, from a peasant village named Pshari in the Northern Mountains, where I live now in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, I live in Kalapuya Ilhi, in the, um, which is the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, the Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribe of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribe of Siletz Indians. So uh, as I'm learning, we're gathered on uh, Treaty 6 uh, uh, territory, which is the homeland and gathering place for a number of indigenous peoples. So since many of us, not all of us, but many of us are uninvited guests to these territories, I encourage you to consider making some sort of gift to a local organization that is committed to strengthening indigenous food uh, sovereignty in this territory. 
Um, so I'm going to focus, obviously, on the right to food. I'm going to focus on the right to food, on food sovereignty, and on food system transformation. But I want to be clear, I'm not speaking in my official capacity today uh, at all. I'm speaking today in my personal capacity as a middle-aged Arab who left his home and garden quite unkempt. As my title suggests, my doc, uh, um, so as I said, it's about the right to food, and again, I'm just gonna say it again, it's about food sovereignty, and it's about food system transformation. And the idea is that these are interrelated. So what I'm gonna do first is explain what the right to food means to me. Second, I'll explain what the food sovereignty movement is about and how, how they, um, their movement relates to the right to food. And then I'll conclude uh, with how to think about food as, a part of, as part of a system and the problems that, with many food systems and how to use the right to food and food sovereignty to transform food systems. So before I get into the specifics, let me share with you my general perspective on all the three of those issues, the right to food, food sovereignty, and food systems transformation. In some ways, it's a little odd for me to be uh, before you today to talk about human rights. I'm aligned with many traditions that are cautious about law's emancipatory potential. More particularly, I come from a tradition of international law that has been very suspicious of human rights law. This tradition, it's called third world approaches to international law, is actually suspicious of all of international law. Because from experience and from history and from contemporary practice, we see how international law has been and continues to be part of imperial adventures. We see how international law has been and continues to be a constituting feature of capitalism. And in turn, imperialism and capitalism in all their interconnected forms continue to be central to international law. But this, this tradition that I come from and other traditions, we don't abandon international law just yet because that seeds too much ground too quickly. Rather, we maintain a critical distance, a critical stance rather, in relation to international law, but we always look for tactical opportunities for resistance and salvage. In fact, a number of traditions have put forward an, uh, uh, convincing critiques of human rights. And I'll give you just a short list of some of those long-standing critiques of human rights. And this is coming from a progressive perspective. So one is that human rights are limited because they focus too much on individual claims and not structural problems. Two, there's a concern that human rights can limit people's agency because it forces everyone to compete against each other as victims. Three, human rights is often used to justify military attacks and occupation. Uh, Iraq is an example. And four, human rights can also limit political possibilities by focusing the process of, on recognizing rights and sometimes avoid substantive issues. And these are all true, I think, in many ways, but that does not mean that human rights is not also able to be deployed as part of a collective action and in militant terms. What I mean by militant is not aggression, but in terms of not necessarily compromising. We shouldn't compromise our human rights. What has inspired me to become a special rapporteur was the food sovereignty movement. This movement began in the mid-1990s, and it was created by peasants primarily from Latin America and Europe, who quickly, and this movement quickly expanded globally. And it drew in not just peasants, but fishers, pastoralists, indigenous peoples. This is the movement that gives the right to food its radical power. And it's then the workers' trade unions, representing food and agricultural workers, that brought their own popular power into the right to food. And with them, they brought international labor law. So this combination of peasants, fishers, pastoralists, indigenous peoples, and workers working in solidarity, they make the right to food. Uh, uh, they create the opportunity for all these movements to come together on a global scale, potentially changing food systems all over the world. So I don't believe in human rights as such. Human rights are a force, like any other force, that can be wielded in all sorts of different ways. What I believe in is people's ability to organize themselves and express their popular power. 
What I believe in is people's ability to use their power to make the world despite profound degrees of oppression, exploitation, and inequality. What I've learned from this food sovereignty movement is that people have been fighting for decades, if not sometimes centuries, to regain power in their food system. In contemporary terms, they're trying to regain it from transnational corporations and those that serve corporate interests. What I have also learned from the food sovereignty movement is that if you change the food system, you change everything. I've also learned from the pandemic and the ongoing food crisis. When the pandemic ended, the food crisis got worse. What I've seen during the pandemic is that despite the anguish, despite the high rates of sickness, and despite the high rates of death, people survived. Everyone here survived the pandemic. During these darkest hours, people expressed their right to food when they organized themselves and took care of each other. They exercised their right to food when they pushed their governments to ensure that they had access to good food. And they deployed the right to food when they resisted against corporations' attempts to dominate food systems. In this way, human rights includes people's right to organize, their right to make collective demands, and their right to resist. So with that general introduction, let me turn to the right to food, and what does the right to food mean to me? I'll explain what human rights means to me in general, and then I'll get into the specifics of the right to food. So you could think about human rights from a lawyer's perspective, that it's an individual set of entitlements. And of course, human rights do carry the power of law. That's what is partly what makes them powerful. But I think it's more uh, helpful to think about human rights and how they have meaning in everyday life. Human rights are about relationships. More specifically, human rights focus on the relationships between government and people. The relation, that relationship is key to getting, out, getting us out of this food crisis and to navigate the complexities of the food system. In the end, a government is only as strong as its people. So things like workers' rights, farmers' rights, women's rights, children's rights, indigenous rights, these are key to keeping people strong. The other relationship that is important is people's relationship to the environment, to the land, to water. People are only as strong as the biosphere. So things like plant health, biodiversity, agroecology, resilience, marine life, these things matter for, as a human rights concern. The purpose of human rights then should be that to ensure that every aspect of society, every sector of the economy works to serve and empower those relationships, the government and the people, the people and the environment. The key to human rights and the right to food specifically is that people are at the center of it all, not profits, not geopolitics. Markets should serve people, and for too long it's been the other way around. So now I'll turn to what the right to food means more specifically. So I'm not going to start with violations and victims of hunger and famine, of bad guys doing criminal things and good guys coming to save the day. And I use gendered language very purposefully here. Let us start with how we actually eat food. The right to food is the right for everyone to celebrate life through their meals with each other in communion. People must have as much power as possible over their, uh, in their own food system to have as much control over their own destiny. In turn, governments are obliged to create the conditions for all people to be able to access good, nutritious, affordable food with dignity now and in the future. So drawing from the International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, this is the treaty that sort of anchors the right to food. The right to food is everyone's right to be free, free from hunger, malnutrition, and famine. Something to keep in mind is that for the past 60 years, if not 100 years or so, hunger and famine are always caused by political forces using food as a weapon or institutional failure due to negligence. The problem of hunger, malnutrition, and famine is always a political problem and not a matter of scarcity as such. 
That means it's not a fantasy to call for the elimination of hunger. To call for the universal freedom from hunger is a political agenda. Moreover, it's an existential agenda. Food is key to how people define their very understanding of community. Food is central to how people establish their relationship with the land and with water. Food is therefore an inherent way that people produce their culture. It's therefore helpful to think of the right to food and human rights as part of a political and cultural agenda. The right to food means that everyone is entitled for their food to always be adequate, available, and accessible. And I'll go through those three points. Adequate. For food to be adequate, very simply, people must have good food. And they have the right to determine what is good food. That means that people must be able to decide for themselves what is culturally, nutritionally, socially, and ecologically appropriate food based on their particular conditions. The key value here is dignity. Food must be available. People must have a reliable source of food. This can either be by directly feeding oneself by working the land or having access to the land and water and rivers and hunting rights and fishing rights. But it's also about ensuring that food is available in shops and markets. The key value here is fairness. People's access to land and water must be equitable and markets should be fair markets. And the third thing is that food must be accessible. Governments must ensure that food um, is always economically accessible to everyone. So that means that institutions must ensure that people uh, are always able to get to a good meal. So this can be through free school meals, uh, fair markets, or a social system that ensures that people have the time and resources necessary to cook at home and to feed their communities. That's economic accessibility. Mm -hmm. Food must be also physically accessible. And that this means that governments must ensure that all food systems and institutions are universally inclusive. Again, the key value here is inclusivity. So I like to think about access, I think about a kitchen, broadly defined. A kitchen can be anywhere that you prepare food. So that means that regardless of a, pers a person's physical ability, their state of health, their legal status, their housing condition, governments must support everyone's ability to get to a kitchen in order to obtain or make a good meal. Keep in mind, this is different than charity, um, where people uh, hand out food and in a way that's not about people's dignity, but they're doing it in a way just to reaffirm their power. Today in some of the community, when I was meeting with the community groups, someone raised the issue of how often uh, Faith-based organizations have used charity as a way to dominate people. Charitable institutions have been used by those with power to try and control people. Whereas from a human rights perspective, uh, what is inherent in all of this, of course, is one sense of dignity. I'll turn now to my second topic, and this is the food sovereignty movement. The only reason the right to food has any radical potential today is because of the food sovereignty movement. I spend most of my time, I'll spend most of my time describing food sovereignty as a movement, as a social movement, and I won't focus too much on food sovereignty as a concept, as an idea. The concept in some ways is actually pretty simple. The idea being that communities and peoples should have power over how their food is produced how food is shared, on what food people should be eating or get access to. Food, uh, food sovereignty as a concept highlights that food is a matter of culture and self-determination, and that food is also a matter of land rights and water rights. What I'll do is I'll begin with a short history of the food sovereignty movement. I'll go into some of the details of the social landscape today. Um, but let me, before I get into the, the the movement itself, I'll explain, if you allow me, uh, briefly explain what food, the food sovereignty movement is resisting. And this is also what workers, food workers, are resisting. What they're resisting is corporate power and industrial agriculture. Much of the world is plagued by industrialized agriculture. 
Industrialized agriculture and food production have been a breeding ground for pathogens. Meatpacking plants around the world during the pandemic were, were, were um, spreading COVID-19 to nearby communities because of poor working conditions and environmental abuses, as an example. More broadly, food systems emit approximately one-third of the world's greenhouse gases. What has driven much of this damage has been intensive industrial agriculture and export-oriented food policies. I'm not against trade as such, but trade has been prioritized in a way that has led to um, environmental destruction. By treating food like a commodity, industrialized agriculture has demanded greater biological homogenization. This is because the reduction of genetic diversity enables faster growing, harvesting, slaughtering, and transportation. It's efficient from an economic perspective. It creates monocultures, and this is about increasing productivity by simplifying nature. But it also creates ecological conditions that facilitate disease. To be sure, we are all, many of us are expecting another pandemic, and not necessarily COVID-19. It could be from um, bacteria, it could be another virus. By prioritizing efficiency, Industrial agriculture drives a constant demand for more territory and large-scale monocrop farms, which pollute land, air, and water, and debase animal life. Approximately one million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. Industrial agriculture and corporate power also encourage employers to prioritize profits over workers' rights and to treat people like replaceable units. To give you a specific instance of how corporate power has been harmful, industrial intensification was designed to make farmers dependent on the expensive inputs provided by agrochemical companies. Today, four, just four agrochemical companies control 60% of the global seed market and 75% of the global pesticides market. If you control seeds, you control life itself. Such market concentration means that a small number of companies will unfairly control the price of seeds. The big four, as they're known, also produce most of the agrochemicals associated with genetically modified seeds. These agrochemicals reduce biodiversity, which lowers agricultural resistance, making farms more vulnerable to climate change shocks. These are the same pesticides that put workers and communities' lives at risk. More generally, the high concentration of corporate power allows a relatively small group of people, let's call them shareholders, to shape markets in a way that serves the ultimate goal of shareholder profit maximization and not the public good. Corporations are by design in the business of generating more commodities. Corporations are not designed to create a flourishing and just food system. In sum, the world has been dominated by corporations and food systems that use wealth to generate more wealth instead of using life to generate more life. More importantly, the concentration of power through corporations on a global scale is symptomatic of an underlying political economic system that is defined by inequality. The world's richest 1% emit double the carbon of the poorest 50%. The world's riches have also profited from the pandemic. It's shameful. With billionaires' wealth swelling to 1.9 trillion with a T, 1.9 trillion dollars in 2020, while global unemployment skyrocketed. The problems of the world's food system stem from the fact that some of the legal building blocks that create a market, contracts and private property rights, have licensed investors to use corporations to financially benefit um, while harming communities all over the world. So, yes, corporations are the immediate problem, but it's the underlying system of property and contract relations. Let's call that capitalism. That's the issue. I'm not gonna leave you there, trust me. <laughs> turning to resistance and the food sovereignty movement now. 
The food sovereignty movement came about, like I said, in the mid-1990s as a global movement. It first arose as resistance against the World Trade Organization, which came into an effect in 1994. In policy and academic circles, trade is usually treated uh, as an issue relating to economic growth or maybe economic development. And depending on what's going on in the world, trade is sometimes uh, treated um, as in geopolitical terms. Whereas to the food sovereignty movement, what is at stake in trade is people's way of life. Peasants, pastoralists, fishers, and indigenous people's resistance against the WTO has been an existential fight. The same is true for workers, even if they're not necessarily formally part of the food sovereignty movement as such. Food sovereignty is not against trade. It is, a, it is against free trade agreements that undo people's long-standing relationships with each other, with the land, and with wa the waterways. The concept of food sovereignty first arose around 1993 with, from the organization called La Via Campesina, a transnational peasant movement. But today it's about more than La Via Campesina. The international food sovereignty movement encompasses two big networks, network of networks that brings together millions of people. So you have the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, and you also have the People's Coalition for Food Sovereignty. And these network of networks bring organizations from all over the world together to debate through differences and find common ground, to develop shared concepts, to mount uh, international campaigns, and to decide on how or whether to tactically engage with international law and institutions. Meanwhile, indigenous peoples and community groups everywhere are also autonomously and on their own taking up the idea of food sovereignty. And I heard this this morning here in Edmonton. In fact, the relationship between food and sovereignty has been central to indigenous struggles for hundreds of years before the rise of the food sovereignty movement. So what happens in the 1990s is La Via Campesina deploys food sovereignty partly as a way to claim and rede to redefine the right to food. Um, and then this starts to change the meaning of concepts at play. Because up until the 1990s, the right to food was primarily about freedom from hunger, which I described to you. But La Via Campesina's strategy was to sharpen the difference between food policies that fed people, but did not have any regard for issues uh, like concentrations of political economic power. Uh, what they wanted is to put forward policies and programs that empowered large, number, large numbers of decentralized, small-scale food producers. They sharpened the difference by highlighting how food security, another more uh, term that's quite common, often people will use the term food security frame, uh, to frame hunger as a technical problem, as a problem of production, maybe sometimes as a matter of distribution, Food sovereignty instead asks, starts with the question of power. Who controls the food system? With this focus on control and power, the food sovereignty movement then deployed human rights as a discourse, as a tool. And so they used the right to food. And the right to food gave people and gave social movements a common language to rally, a way to connect their different interests, interests and to join together against a common problem. It became a tool that made it easier for groups to work together in solidarity. I'll conclude now with the idea of food systems and food system transformation. The concept of food systems is an idea that was developed to push against only looking at food as a matter of agricultural policy or food safety. To understand food as part of a system is to appreciate all the different parts of production, distribution, and consumption of food, and to try and understand how all those different parts interact and influence each other. As we all experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic, the first thing that cracked during the, healthcare crisis, the health crisis was our food system. And we've been in a global food crisis since 2020 and it doesn't seem to be getting better. In very general terms, the rate of hunger and malnutrition has been on the rise since 2015. The pandemic made existing problems worse. This was because of lockdowns. 
because workers' health and safety were not adequately addressed, because migrant workers in rural communities were dehumanized. We had so-called supply chain disruptions. That just meant that workers were, were dying. It was because people couldn't go to work, go to shops, or visit each other. People could not access food. No country, rich or poor, has escaped the food crisis. Moreover, all this is against the backdrop of a climate change crisis. And now it's a cost of living crisis. And because of the pandemic, also, almost every country is experiencing a debt crisis. But to call things a crisis suggests that the problems are an anomaly. It's a, it's a blip. It's a dysfunction of the system. However, all these crises were actually predictable. And more importantly, they were avoidable. The problems are structural. So let me end with a political agenda of how to transform food systems from a human rights perspective. Let me frame the problem. The problem is that our current food systems and economy are based on relationships of dependency and extractivism. The conditions that have enabled these crises, these cycles of structural inequality, of systemic violence, are relationships of dependency, relationships of extractivism. What I mean by relationships of dependency means that one party heavily relies on another, while the other party can walk away more easily from the relationship at any point, giving them profound degrees of bargaining power. Food systems are created, constituted through a series of dependency relationships. On an international scale, importing countries depend on global markets for food. Food exporting countries depend on global markets for capital. And developing countries depend on international financial institutions and richer countries for capital. On an interpersonal scale, farmers are incentivized to increasingly depend on transnational corporations for inputs. Inputs meaning seed, fertilizer, pesticides, if you will. People are more dependent on a shrinking number of food commodities for their nourishment, sold to them by a small number of transnational corporations. We're eating a smaller variety of foods. We're eating more corn, more soy. If you look at people's diets 100, 200 years ago, people were eating a wide range of foods and grains and fruits and vegetables. Also, on an interpersonal scale, workers often have no choice but to depend on employers for their livelihood. Those are relationships of dependency. Dep uh, relationships, relationships of extraction. Extractivist economies imagine nature as a source of resources, and they rely on the extraction and export of these so-called natural resources. The assumption is that if we exploit nature, it's worth it because the, the, the ensuing revenue will be shared with the, uh, uh, will be shared and will benefit the public at large. Extraction from nature and exploitation of people are inherently linked. You can't separate the two. How you treat nature is always going to be how you treat people and vice versa. So from a right to food perspective, extractivism generates two problems. First, extractivist projects undermine and destroy traditional and small-scale hunting, fishing, herding, and agriculture, along with foraging and gardening practices. All these practices that enhance biodiversity. Second, more food systems are becoming more lethal because they limit biodiversity, as I outlined earlier. It does this by taking from the land and leaving nothing in return, turning the soil barren. Soil depletion then makes farmers more dependent on chemical inputs and high energy processes. This is why food systems generate approximately one third of world's, the world's greenhouses, uh, world greenhouse gases. This is why our food systems are turning soil and land into desert. Let me frame the solution then. We, what do we want to transform? We want to transform the relationships of dependency and extraction into relationships based on care and reciprocity. Food is at the center of the economy of care. And care is not just about 
uh, attending directly to people's emotional and physical needs. It includes all activities that nourish and nurture all the elements that are necessary for people's welfare and for them to flourish. Understood in this way, care captures the need of individuals in vulnerable situations. It also captures the social capacity to care through institutions and the needs of people who are care workers, caregivers, who are essential for all of our well-being, for humanity's very existence. Centering care work aligns with a human rights-based uh, approach because for too long and in too many places, people who take care of others have, are often the most marginalized and undervalued. And the care economy is also the fundamental work that arises from taking care of the land, the water, and other life forms and beings. It also raises the question about how to care for strangers, guests, and distant others. I witnessed during the COVID-19 pandemic how when people were struggling and hunger was on the rise in profound ways, people were also taking care of each other. By taking care of their kin, taking care of their friends and neighbors, pe what people were doing was they were making sure that someone was strong enough to take care of them in their own time of need. Relationships of reciprocity were key to ensuring people were resilient during the pandemic. So turning now to concrete advice on how to recover and transform Recovery and transformation of food systems is about power, not just policy. The challenge with trying to transform food systems does not lie in the scarcity of solutions. There's policy solutions everywhere. To say that there's a lack of political will as a conclusion is not enough. The problem is about reconfiguring power in food systems so that relationships become based on care and reciprocity, and that's what will allow, allow for meaningful change to occur. People and governments are already building the future they want. I heard it today, this morning in Edmonton. Edmonton knows how to deal with hunger in its own community. The answers were there with nuance and sophistication with the understanding the, the ambiguity of all of it. I heard it all, day, all throughout the day today. Just as the pandemic exasperated inequality, people survived by deepening their relationship with each other in the land. So my final suggestion, what I'm gonna outline are policies that would enable both recovery and transformation and reconfigure power in food systems in a way that fulfills the right to food based on actual existing practices, what I've witnessed or what I've heard and what I've studied from all over the world. I'm gonna tell you what practices should end and what they should be replaced with. That's what transformation is about. Okay, and I'm gonna cover a lot in these remaining moments, I admit this, but my purpose is to show that food system transformation based on human rights principles and the goal of ending hunger is something very practical and very achievable. It's three, three things. One, shifting from industrial agriculture to what people call agroecology. Agroecology combines traditional and scientific knowledge, binding together social and cultural practices with, eco, uh, with ecology and agronomy. Agroecology has proven to lead to the tangible realization of the right to food. Its primary goal is to mimic ecological processes and biological interactions as much as possible. And a large body of research puts forward that agroecology is often more productive than industrial intensive techniques. But this is true only, depends on how you calculate productivity. So agroecology is better if you calculate productivity in terms of per hectare and not per single crop. It's not how many bushels of corn do you produce, but how much does this piece of land produce? And it's also more, agroecology is more productive if we measure energy input versus only focusing on output of commodities. 
agroecological and smallholder-led modes of supplying the world's food do not focus exclusively on, on crop yields. Of course, crop yield matters. But it also looks at things more holistically in terms of individual, communal, and environmental well-being. Agroecology also focuses on the relationship amongst all living beings in a food system by framing those relationships in terms of equity and fairness. Two, to shift from prioritizing global markets to supporting what people call territorial markets. So with the pandemic and food crisis, governments all over the world have finally realized that if you rely too much on trade, as a source of food or a source of income, it leaves people incredibly vulnerable to geopolitics and market fluctuations. The war in Ukraine is an example. For decades, social movements have been warning about this danger created by the trade regime to reclaim food sovereignty. There is, however, a new consensus. National governments finally realize that they must invest in more local production for the purpose of local consumption. Okay, but you know, markets are more complicated than I, just local or global. Local markets are inherently affected by global economic conditions. And global trade only feeds a minority. Most people don't get their food by, from trade. They actually get it mostly from um, local markets. So this idea of territorial markets is an important element and it's gaining a lot of recognition and support internationally. So think about territorial markets as markets that connect different rural and urban communities together. An example, just a very easy example to think about is, think about farmers markets in Edmonton. The concept of territory is open enough to capture transboundary trade. Um, indigenous territory crosses formal political boundaries, international boundaries as an example of territory. Hmm? Sometimes people trade across international borders, but those borders are porous. And the market actually though is internationally, technically speaking, it actually operates more like a local market. So think of local commercial life in border towns between Canada and the US. Sorry, it's gonna be an Ontario example, but if any of you have been to Windsor, Windsor in Detroit is almost like a local market. The third point, and this is my last point, Shifting from corporations to what are called social and solidarity economic entities. If corporations are designed to limit liability, and if corporations are designed to increase profits, then social and solidarity, the social and solidarity economy promotes entities such as cooperatives, worker-owned entities, and mutual aid networks. In April of 2023, so very recently, the UN General Assembly turned its attention to the social and solidarity economy. And it recognized that a transformative and integrated response is urgently needed to address the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, change geopolitical tensions, uh, because they're all deepening inequality. And, and it passed a resolution in light of that, recognizing the transformative effect of a social and solidarity economy, along with its ability to alleviate poverty. So the social and solidarity economy encompasses enterprises, organizations, and other entities engaged in economic, social, and environmental activities. The point is that they're serving the common good, not as a secondary matter, not as a marketing ploy to get you to buy more stuff, but as their main function and purpose. The social and solidarity economy enterprises prioritize people and social purpose over capital in the distribution and use of surplus and profit. They are organized around principles of equality, fairness, interdependence, self-governance, accountability, and the attainment of decent work and livelihood. So let me end. As you've heard tonight, we cannot assume that human rights in and of itself is a force for good or progressive change. We have to work hard to use whatever tools are available to create forces of good Sometimes those tools are human rights. Because of the food sovereignty movement, because of the hard work of indigenous peoples, workers, peasants, small-scale farmers, fishers, pastoralists, because of the hard work of communities in towns and cities, like in Edmonton, the right to food is a radical tool that can transform our food system in a way that can eliminate hunger. 
But let's be careful to not get too caught up in human rights since it can force us to focus too much on people's entitlements and government obligations. When thinking about food, it's always important to keep in mind that at its best, at its most pleasurable, food is an expression of our love and care for each other and for the land. Thank you very much. for a superb uh, lecture, I think, as anticipated. My name is Stan Blade. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Alberta. I have the good fortune of being in, in that position, a, a faculty that ties together agriculture to food to nutrition to human health, uh, and we do that doing uh, excellent science on everything from water to soil to biodiversity and using tools like economics and, and, uh, and other ways of actually teasing out some of the issues that you've heard about tonight. I have a very simple task of directing the traffic of your fantastic questions. Uh, we have a couple of roaming mics in the crowd. Uh, the lights are extremely bright, so I will just let you formulate your questions. If you get the eye of one of our microphone bearers, uh, I will come to you in just a moment, so let's do that. Oh, but thank you for the housewife. Yes, thank you very much, that's very helpful. Uh, just maybe to get us started, and it's always dangerous to make a reference to a quote that you gave maybe a couple of years ago. Oh, Climate change is a problem, and the food system is part of the problem and part of the solution. Food systems and climate change go hand in hand. It, you made me think of it when you talked about the crisis. Do you still see that piece where the food system is maybe both part of the problem and part of the solution, or has your thinking evolved? Oh, to be quoted from years ago, I don't know. If you ask me <laughs> what, I had for, what I had for breakfast, Unfair I have no in all idea. Fronts, yeah. yes. I mean, what I, what, I, what I mean by that is, um, first to highlight, so people are quick to say we need to uh, fix our food systems, or they, or it's also a lot of climate change policymakers and even climate change activists don't think of food systems. Or if they do, they only think of it as the problem, maybe. Mm. So it's really about connecting those two movements, those two sort of ideas or debates and to bring them closer together. I am more hopeful than I was several years ago, probably when that quote was, in that the right to food, when the pandemic started, governments did not take up the right to food. And part of what we had to fight within the UN, so remember the UN is a complicated mix and it has power just like anywhere else. And what was ha I was witnessing firsthand in the UN is the corporate takeover of the UN. There was a UN food system summit that was held in September 2021. And it was organized by the pro-corporate sector through the World Economic Forum. And not to sound like an old Arab conspiracy theorist, but I, I saw it happen with my own eyes. And so we had to fight to get human rights on a, on a, a UN food system summit under, that was organized under the auspices of the Secretary General to say, you have to have human rights on this agenda. What that told me, because the option, what they could have done, and they didn't do it, I was surprised. What they didn't do is put human rights on the agenda, but water it down, right, to make, sort of empty it out of meaning. Rather, they were terrified. They did everything they tried to do anything they could to not let human rights be on the agenda. And when they finally agreed towards the end, they tried to keep it in the margins because, because they knew that the right to food was such a radical tool they couldn't, whatever the equivalent of greenwashing is mm -hmm. in, in this space, they couldn't, do, they couldn't do it. And that's more true today than ever. Governments have finally caught up with people. People have been organizing for the last two and three years around the right to food, protecting the meaning and power of it. And finally, governments have realized people are right. And now, this year, governments are organizing themselves, are working together. And they're finally starting to realize they have to cooperate with each other to deal with the food crisis. Think about it. There's been no international global response to the food crisis. 
Nothing. Right? But now that's changing around the rights of food. Superb. I'm just going to try to go by sector here. So if the microphone is there somewhere, we'll take that side first, and then we're coming to someone over there when the time comes. So hello, uh, good evening. My name is Peter Sigetti. I'm at the Faculty of Law. I'm very happy to have heard uh, Professor Fakhri here. And um, I'd like to um, ask three questions related to um, to what we could call the more traditional corporate side of food policy, things that I have could sort of taken for granted. Could we maybe do the first question just in to make sure that we get to as many people as possible, and then I guarantee you I'll come back to you if there's a, a yawning gap. Thank you. Uh, yes. So. Um, what I know about food policy is that it prioritizes creating as many calories as possible uh, at any cost, basically. So um, the traditional uh, answer to the right to food is let's produce as much wheat, rice, soybeans at any cost, including the environment, and that's how we will end hunger. Um, how do we know that prioritizing food sovereignty uh, will not raise the number of people who are hungry in the world. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, so f before I answer, the, so just let me sort of describe the, the, the fight that's happening amongst the, within the corporate sector itself. So what's happening is that the old way of doing things is, is being recognized is we can't carry on with how Peter describes sort of creating as many calories as possible as any cost. What's coming in now through the concept of sustainability mm -hmm. is, okay, let's do things differently. Let's create different policies. Let's not produce as many calories at any cost. Let's pay attention to the environment. Let's pay attention to biodiversity. Uh, let's pay attention to uh, decent work um, et cetera, but let's not change the power structure. Let's just m try to get corporations and those with power to do things better. Th so it's sort of the green corporate sector, and it's a big fight. It's not that they all get along. So industrial ag, the industrial meat industry, meat packing are fighting hard against that. And so meanwhile, the food sovereignty movement is against both of those sort of parties, if you will. And so what food sovereignty, sort of the movement, is, the perspective it's coming from is the idea that communities, if you, give, if you trust people, they will know how to feed themselves because that's what we've been doing for thousands of years. And we're always changing. So the idea of relying on traditional practices is not backwards looking. Rather, it's reclaiming a particular history and trajectory. Historically speaking, corporations have only dominated our food systems in the last 60 years. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. Industrialization starts really on a global scale. We could argue over this, but we could maybe around 1860. Again, that's relatively recent. Some people will say, well, industrialization allowed for the alleviation of hunger and, and, and prevented famine and this and that. I mean, there have been some benefits, but at a huge cost, at a huge cost. So what's happening now sort of is more and more scientific studies are coming and sort of catching up with the movement and are confirming and are finding ways then to combine traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge through to make sure that we all eat well. Because you know, from the statistics, from what we heard in the introduction before me, what you heard from me is, it's not like things are going well right now. Right? It's not like, oh, you know, industrial ag is so productive and you don't know what you're talking about. It's, we can find, I think the, the pandemic set showed us, it's not that it's not working, it's killing us. The, syst the, the system as it is, is killing us. So the idea is trust, and power and tradition is this idea, it's dynamic. And there's knowledge in that. And there's the idea is we're always learning and adapting. So it has an adaptability to it. Thank you, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, we'll go to this side, please. Uh, thank you very much for this lecture. I really appreciate it. Um, 
the talk and a lot of the information you shared. My name is Philo Keki Hejurika. I'm a professor in the Women and Gender Studies Department, U of A. Um, my question is really about the power structure. When I listen to the solutions you give, um, as a person who grew up in the middle of an African village, and I have been going back and forth uh, to Africa because it's one of my research bases, um, I tell myself this is what my foremothers and forefathers have been practicing for centuries. Given the power structure that have turned these traditions upside down and the impact on my people, because when I, the hunger is ravaging sub-Saharan Africa at a very, very fast rate, but they have very little power at the UN or anywhere. They are not part of the Security Council. They really have very little voice. What advice do you have for these societies? And I don't mean countries, because we are really not countries. What advice do you have for these societies who are struggling? I mean, first and foremost, it's, it's the people's power. It's going to sound. Uh, try it, but it's people's power arises from their ability to organize. Because when people organize and act collectively, then they first, they are able to identify what's causing the problem. They're able to then target those problems and then fight against it. And what I'm seeing is that governments, it's hard for governments to not respond to uh, organized people, to collective action in that way. And to find new relationships. That's how I think change happens. By either changing existing relationships, which I really focused more on tonight, but also then by finding, creating new relationships, maybe with people that you haven't had relationships with before. Um, and that's the best I can offer in, in these general terms. Thank you very much. I will go back to this side if there is a question uh, from another audience member. I see a hand right there. Yes, please feel free. I'm Katerina Snyder. I'm not a professor. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> this question might be a little out there, but it struck me. Does the right to food play a role, and could it offer some common ground, since it's something we all come together around, in the polarization we're seeing in society, such as the gender identity and sexual orientation issue that's being protested right now? <laughs> but here's why, but here's why. Um, what I keep seeing and why I love talking and thinking about food. First of all, you can always talk about food with anybody. It's with anybody. First, when I teach, the first question I ask is, what's your comfort food? Not where are you from? As a migrant, that's a complicated question. An Arab on a green card, you don't ask that person where are you from, right? And what I'm seeing concretely is that politics around food when it works does not usually map onto existing political divides. I'll give you a very specific example. In the United States, the state of Maine recently amended their state constitution to include the right to food an economic, social, cultural right in the United States. It sounds like communism, right? <laughs> and they have food sovereignty legislation in Maine. This is the first, this is where things are, it's very interesting in the United States. And everyone in the US is paying attention to Maine. The, the, the campaign around this was grassroots, and it did not map onto US a liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican divides. You had people working together that would never work together on any other issue, but on reclaiming power and putting it in the hands of the people, they did agree on that. And they agreed on the problem of too much power concentrated in the hands of the few. And, it, and I'm seeing this everywhere. That's what I mean by new relationships. And there's something, I think, that's why I'm hopeful about food, because Politics everywhere is polarized. You know, here I am talking about food sovereignty as a movement. The reason is sovereignty can be used in a way that can be nationalistic, racist, sexist. And so I can imagine a fascist version of food sovereignty 
It's not difficult to imagine it being used in nationalist terms. But the movement, you know, within the food sovereignty movement, it started off very patriarchal. It was feminist struggles within the food sovereignty movement that forced the movement itself to reconcile with its own problems and limitations. Hmm? So that's why I gave such a, a slightly, you know, facetious answer in the beginning. But yes, I, I, I truly believe that. Yeah. We're going to go back to this side, and it's not escape my uh, observation that we're skewing towards the outside of the uh, audience here. So show courage, people in the middle. We will pass you the microphone. Uh, but please, the question over here. And I'll pour you some water in case you, oh, wait, oh. you have water. Or maybe already. Um, I just had a question around what keeps you hopeful for the future of food sovereignty and the future of achieving zero hunger. And if that comes from listening to political side of things and your work with the UN, or if that comes from those grassroots human-led movements. Yeah. I'm always, I get called hopeful a lot, and I'm always, conf like, I almost take it like, I'm not hopeful. <laughs> May I interrupt just for a moment? <laughs> we were having lunch together, and Michael called himself uncharacteristically optimistic uh, on a particular topic. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, you are full value for yeah. what you're saying. You know, shame on you for calling me hopeful. <laughs> no, I tease, I tease. Um, but I understand, thank you for that question. What it is for me first is, I think what drives me is what choice do I have? What choice do any of us have but to struggle? The choices, especially during the pandemic, it's, Give up or fight. I don't want to give up. That's, that's, why, that's what drives me. And then the second part is, I don't think I have hope, I have faith. And that's why in the formal part of the lecture, I, talked, I said what I believe in. Um, you know, we all have different faiths and different religions, and I believe in the power of people's ability to organize as a force of change. Sometimes people organize as a force of change and it's terrifying, right? But it's powerful. And right now, I'm saying right to food and food sovereignty. In 10 years, I might say food sovereignty is a disastrous idea because of how things changed and how context changed. I mean, I should disclose, I've known Peter for a long time. He's probably more surprised than I am that here I am talking about human rights. <laughs> But it's very contextual. This place and this time and place today, I think it's the, the way to go. But we should all be ready to pick up new concepts and new tools and have new relationships and always be assessing, is this a good thing? What's at stake? Who has power? Is this fair? And to, be, and to not align our identity too much with these things, but rather be a lot more dynamic as Things are only going to get faster, and change is only going to happen more quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, one, once more to this side of the audience, any uh, questions from this side that people would like to have somewhere in the middle? I'm looking at you. Um, if not, I do see someone over there, but continue to put your questions together. Uh, yes, please. I just uh, hope to hear the other two questions from the law student. <laughs> Opportunity, we will take full advantage of that. Professor Zagetti. Peter, you, are, you, uh, you have the ringing endorsement of at least one person. Uh, please feel free. Let's go to question number two. I am an assistant professor, but uh, I, I relish the fact that I look youthful, apparently. Um, so staying with food sovereignty, I'm, I'm actually very curious about what that means for places like Canada, where uh, I doubt the possibility whether we could uh, grow enough food, especially nutritious food, fruits, vegetables for 40 million people, or Egypt with 80 million people um, and very little arable land. Um, so um, what does this mean for places where, which have operated on the assumption that they can always um, import enough food? Thank you, Peter. I think that's the most important question to be put to the food sovereignty movement, and I'll explain it. And I'm not avoiding the question. Food sovereignty 
in many ways, starts off as an, a, an idea of self-reliance, but it, come, it used to really come from a definition of self-reliance, much as, as we heard in the question, which is, let us grow all the food that our community needs, our country needs, our however you draw the circle need, and not have to import or export food. But mo many places can't function that way. I'm from Lebanon, we can't do that. Islands can't do that. Canada can't do that. That's exactly right. So the open question that nobody has a good answer to, including the food sovereignty movement, is what is a trade regime look like that is built upon food sovereignty as a concept? That's what I've been trying. So I, my, my original area of focus was trade. That's how I got into food sovereignty. So the critique is finally gaining traction in, in government levels, only now. And I think the way forward would be something like this. One, um, understanding the importance of land rights and land not as private property. The current system of sovereignty and in international law really relies on a notion of property and property rights that focuses on private control, complete dominion over a certain parcel of land. Food sovereignty movement starts with a more open notion of land tenure, not treating land as a commodity, something to be bought and sold easily, but rather on trying to maintain stability so that people have a long-standing relationship with land. It's a place just to start conceptually, changing, the, you know, pushing against private property being the dominating um, uh, way of relating to each other in the land. Second, it then becomes prioritizing first, so it becomes a sequencing problem. Start with trying to grow as much locally as possible for local consumption, not just to be able to, you're not going to feed everyone from that local production, but what that does is a couple of things. One, it forces a hard choice that should be made politically and communally and socially and culturally, okay, what should we produce locally? We can't produce all the food we want, but what should we produce? That's a choice, that's a political choice that becomes a debate. And then what that does is, is, is it, what you produce locally is in effect your most direct relationship with the land. It's you as a community, as a political body, choosing to, to have a very specific relationship with the land through what you eat, what you grow, what you hunt, um, what you fish, what you uh, gather. Hmm? It's an ecological relationship. And then finally, what it does, and this I learned from the pandemic, it, it helps in times of crisis when you've made a choice of what to lo grow locally and if it's the food that's the most important to your community in terms of defining who your community is existentially, culturally, uh, ecologically. So when times are hard, at least at least you have some foodstuffs that are core aspects to keep your community strong to sort of push through whatever supply chain issue you're, you're going through. So I think where I'm now encouraging the food sovereignty movement and, the international, and through international law is changing the notion of self, so using the notion of self-reliance, there's something attractive, but where the self is relational and it's about choosing what relationships you want to have in trade and deciding, you know, here, I'll take a step, uh, you know, NATO, the way NATO is, if you attack my neighbor, I'll attack you. Why don't we do something like, well, if my neighbor goes hungry, we'll help you, mm -hmm. right? Self-reliance means let's make an agreement. These four countries, these six communities, these four cities, these 13 universities agree, when you go hungry, I've got your back, and when I go hungry, you've got my back. That's how we operated in the pandemic with our neighbors, with our kin, with our friends. Right? So the self becomes, by definition, relational. I'm going to make the last call in a moment, but I will just point out, Michael just mentioned the, the fact that his, uh, some of his early beginnings on the trade law front, just for the, 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 the crowd to know, uh, President Bill Flanagan, of course, taught trade law at Queen's, and Michael was one of his students, yeah. uh, yay, those many years, maybe three or four years ago or something yeah, like yeah, that, sure. something, something of that nature. 1999 was just yesterday. <laughs> Uh, last, yes, please, right here. Hi, my name is Amelia. My, I really admire the idea of food sovereignty. 
Um, my question to you, though, is this. Uh, so I have a roommate. He loves strawberries. And they're not always in season, but he still wants strawberries. What do you say to people who, while perhaps are supportive of the idea of food sovereignty, are not conscious of what realistically we can produce as a country? Like, we have been really spoiled by what we are able to import. And suddenly, now that's not available. Cauliflower is $12. Avocados, like that is another category altogether. Nobody can live without their avocado toast. <laughs> but we want our avocados, but we believe in food sovereignty. We can't produce avocados. Then there's the issue of like supply chain management with specific regards to our dairy department. Um, during the pandemic, Canada flushed away thousands of liters of milk because it was under supply chain management. We talk about food sovereignty, we produce this stuff, and then we throw it away, yeah. while apparently we are advocating for the right to food. How do you reconcile all those ideas into something that the public can accept? Thank yeah. you. So you want a new roommate? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the question? <laughs> she needs a new roommate. <laughs> No, um, I don't know. I really don't know because I think the challenge I face, you know, I don't want to tell anyone how to eat. And that's not, I'm, that's, I, that doesn't make me, a, there's many people in these circles that do want to sort of push, eat like this, don't eat like that. I often get asked, and I'll address your question more directly in a second. I often get asked in terms of how should I eat and what should I eat, especially in light of climate change. And I don't have a good answer because I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who you are. I don't know your background. I don't know what's meaningful to you. I don't know what your childhood was like and what food meant to you personally or whatever. And I don't think the change is gonna happen from personal choice. That's why I like how in your question it became immediately very structural and sort of systemic. Um, and then communities, so the, many communities are told you shouldn't eat like this and you should eat like that. And it's sometimes it's hypocrisy. So you'll have Western experts or experts based on Western institutions. We must eat less meat because meat produces X many, it's greenhouse gases and carbon. And some communities are saying, we're fighting so hard to feed our kids more meat. Who are you to tell me? Like, so it becomes some, the power dynamics of it all. Hmm? That's why I'm gonna start, in my, I wanna talk to people and ask, how do we make choices about eating in a way that is not a question of personal choice in light of climate change? Because how we eat always changes. I don't eat like my parents. They don't eat like their parents. If you move from, your, from one place to another, you change how you eat. When you grow older, you change how you eat. What your neighbor eats is different than what you... So we're always changing what we, we eat anyway. And there are traditions, and traditions are dynamic. So the question I want to go out and ask everyone in the world is, how should we be eating in a way that recognizes these power imbalances, that isn't wagging our finger in a particular way, and maybe we get to keep eating strawberries? I don't know. We'll find out. And often the way we eat, what I love about understanding recipes is there's knowledge in a recipe. Hmm? There's supply management in a recipe. There's technique of making do with what you have in a recipe. There's uh, histories of oppression in a, in, a, in, a, in a dish, but then that becomes part of your culture anyway. In Hawaii, spam is eaten very popularly, and it's part of sort of local food culture. I'm not judging it. It comes from a history of colonialism. I'm not going to tell people don't eat spam. Yes, it's high in salt and all of that, but that con with, people have complicated his, his relationships uh, with, that, with that food. Fry bread in many indigenous communities is, is based on a history of, of limited colonial, limited uh, uh, resources because of colonialism. But fry bread is also a source of pleasure and love and joy. So that's, that's the ambiguity we have to nav navigate. Um, and just make sure we live with people that we can stand. <laughs>
So I would like to just thank all of you for being engaged for the great questions. I know that Carrie is probably going to do this more formally, but we're going to have the opportunity to carry on these conversations outside over food and drink uh, very appropriately. So I think a round of applause for Michael, I think, would be very appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fakri. Uh, we are so pleased that you accepted our invitation to deliver this special anniversary edition of the University of Alberta Visiting Lectureship in Human Rights. We hope you will accept our deep appreciation for your thought-provoking presentation here this evening and for the time that you spent earlier today with our Edmonton and campus communities, and we love hearing how much you enjoyed that. Thank you for the work you're doing to bring attention to the complex issues which generate systemic inequalities in our food systems. It has been a privilege to spend this evening with you to reflect on these inequalities and equalities and food rights, and especially I appreciated the end, your impassioned call for care, reciprocity, and love. I think that's something we can all use a lot more of. Again, to our donors, thank you for your gifts that provide this annual opportunity for us as a community to learn, question, and participate in events that shape the world in which we live. To the staff and volunteers who contribute to its organization and delivery of this event, thank you for your commitment to bringing us this evening. A special thanks, of course, to the U of A Jazz Band for helping to welcome us to tonight's lecture. Thank you all. And to everyone in attendance, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And in the spirit of conviviality and togetherness that food brings, I invite you now to join us in the lobby for refreshments and continued conversation on the right to food. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.